Okay, so without further ado, here's another story of interest from Michael Seema and Mike Buer, whom we funded a few years ago to um, see what they could do about treating a devastating disease, which is advanced ovarian cancer, which unfortunately is 70% of the ovarian cancer that develops in people in this and most American, if not worldwide, cities. And the title of their grant and their talk is The Development of an Osmotic Micropump as a Way of Delivering Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy in this Disease. Gentlemen. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Beer. I'm a medical oncologist at Mass General, and I'm the program leader of the Cancer uh, Program within the DFHCC. And I, let me start out by just uh, thanking the Bridge Project for the funding of this, and I think I speak for the entire team. When we first thought about this idea, it was very clear this was an out-of-the-box thought. I would say moderately high risk compared to the NIH grants where basically study sections expect to have the answer in front of them before they fund you. Uh, and that kind of project, that the excitement with that really needs this kind of funding to get it off the ground. And I think in the next few minutes you'll see that that money has been well spent and we're off the ground and running. Uh, and actually accumulating data to where at some point additional funding could come from a more traditional source. So again, thank you very much. So I'm here to basically tell you a little bit about how bad ovarian cancer is. In 2013, 14,000 women will die from this. And um, what's important to recognize is that that's uh, reflecting 22,000 new cases. Um, and the five-year survival rate is only about 44%. So this is the highest case fatality rate of all gynecologic cancers. Now the reason that is, um, is because of its late diagnosis. And here's just a cartoon to show you. If we can diagnose this disease when it's limited to the ovaries or, or perhaps in the pelvis, but mostly the ovaries, um, in fact, surgery and chemotherapy, the five-year survival rate is reasonably good between 80 and 90 percent. Unfortunately, only 25 percent, some people even think as low as 20 percent of women, are diagnosed with a tumor at this stage. Unfortunately, the rest of the cases are diagnosed at advanced stage, stage three or four. Shown here, the tumor has already spread throughout the abdomen, up on the liver and the diaphragms. Uh, these patients still have therapeutic options. They undergo optimal debulking. The surgeon takes out all of the tumor. They undergo then adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, but this tumor eventually comes back. Uh, we frequently go through multiple relapses. It becomes drug resistant. Um, and the five year survival rate is, I think, rather dismal for this disease, anywhere from 15% to 30%. Now, one of the interesting, unique aspects of ovarian cancer is that we do have an option of what we would call an anatomically privileged delivery of chemotherapy called intraperineal administration chemotherapy. This has been around for a long time. Uh, these um, ports are placed and tunneled through the abdominal wall. The, uh, the source for the pump is actually subcutaneous. Uh, and then the patient will come into the clinic and chemotherapy will fuse directly into the abdomen, usually about two liters. Um, and again, this was developed almost 30 years ago. There are multiple prospective randomized studies suggesting that this is an optimal treatment for many of these patients. I'll just show you one. This is what's called Gynecologic Oncology Group Study 172. It was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, in 2006. And this randomized ladies who came into the clinic to either traditional intravenous therapy versus this intraperitoneal therapy. And you can see here, what you're looking at is the disease portion uh, this is progression-free survival. The upper curve is intraperineal therapy. The lower curve is uh, intravenous therapy. And those ladies getting intraperineal therapy are doing better. And what's probably more exciting oops, sorry, is that this translated into overall survival. The upper curve is the overall survival of patients who received intraperineal therapy. The lower curve, uh, intravenous therapy. This, in fact, at the time, was the single largest prolongation of median survival for women with ovarian cancer of any randomized phase three trial that I see. So there was a lot of excitement about this. However, this has not become the standard of care. We do do it in certain academic centers, but it is not generally accepted. And part of the reason is shown here, problems with IP therapy. There are catheter-related infections. Catheter gets blocked, it leaks. There are still fairly large 
uh, leakage of chemotherapy out of the interperineal cavity, causing myelosuppression, neuropathy, and other toxicities. Um, and, you know, frankly, getting two liters of fluid into your abdomen is not pleasant. And we generally infuse this in. We then tilt the ladies up and down, sort of like the rocker that you see in the laboratory. This is not a pleasant procedure. So these are all problems. And in the study I just showed you, 60% of the ladies on that trial in interperineal therapy never completed the trial. And that's how toxic the therapy is. So when we looked at this, thought about the problem, could we come up with a solution that would give us the advantages of interperineal therapy without the toxicity? And so these are our solutions. Basically eliminate the catheter and port, keep the area under the curve the same or maybe better, but make sure that the concentration of drug in the perineal cavity is low and lasting, uh, and maybe just eliminate all the infusion volume. And so that led to our overall solution, which is localized drug delivery. The objective was to develop a laparoscopically implantable, that means we can put it in by scope, there's no tunneling, there's no cutting, it just goes in and removable continuous release drug delivery device for late stage ovarian cancer to improve treatment efficacy and reduce morbidity. And with that, I'll pass over to my colleague, Mike. Thank you, Mike. So just to start with some data in support of uh, Mike's comment on the area under the curve, if you look at, a, this is just three different cell lines in vitro that, uh, yes indeed, maybe I should use this mic then. This is uh, if you look at three different cell lines, even ones that are uh, cisplatin resistant, uh, at, at high enough or low concentration, you can still kill these, kill these cells as long as you have the low concentration there long enough. And so this was how we started the project. We had some evidence like this that, that uh, continuous exposure at low concentrations, as long as the area under the curve is large, will kill these cells. So we designed a, uh, a study in animals uh, with uh, a single small device to release the drug over uh, continuously over a period of time. And the control was IP bolus injections uh, in the control arm. So this uh, Basically, we follow this by bioluminescence, and also uh, what I'll show you here is uh, actually total tumor burden at the end of the study. So this was uh, a shot in the dark as far as the dose from the device, but you can see that uh, the uh, bioluminescence uh, uh, data shows that uh, with the device you, you do get response, um, and the total tumor burden at the end uh, is also demonstrates response. Now, we didn't know what the dose was uh, appropriate for the device, so we then entered into a um, dose response. Oh, sorry, this is the toxicity for that study. Um, what's really impressive here, as you can see, these are the weekly dosings of the, uh, of the, uh, of the IP dosing, and you can see the weight of the animal drops immediately. There's some recovery it drops, whereas the device group, uh, you don't see anywhere near the kinds of toxicity. So we're seeing what we would hope that we see tumor response and uh, low toxicity because uh, Mike tells me and, and all, everybody I've talked to says if we can demonstrate equivalence to IP therapy with lower toxicity, we've got a winner. So then uh, so this uh, says the next study design was to start to look at um, larger, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the pharmacokinetics arm of the study to see uh, how uh, the drug is distributed in the animals. So this is the, uh, this is the IP uh, concentration of drug as a function of time. Obviously the peaks here, this is a log scale, these are, uh, from a lavage sample, you see the uh, high concentration that you, you get by an IP injection, and it rapidly drops. Whereas from the, in the device groups, you maintain a, a low but continuous concentration in the peritoneum, which is what we were hoping to, to show. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the area under the curve here 
despite the uh, IP uh, bolus dosing being, having very, very high peak concentrations, uh, the area of the curve is actually slightly larger for the device group than it is for the IP um, bolus group. And now we get to the uh, dose study. So it's a similar type study uh, for the IP bolus arm. And we look at uh, tumor burden at the end. And here, instead of uh, single devices, what we did was uh, have multiple devices in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the animal. And of course, we do see a, a, a dose response for these two types of, uh, for these two doses. What's interesting here in the end, uh, and that goes to the engineering, is that this wasn't actually four times the release rate of a single device. So that's caused us to go back and that's another story, but it surprised us to go back and rethink how, we, how the device should be working. But uh, for, from a, a lot of drug development studies that I've, been, I've worked on in the past, it's imperative to show a, a dose response before you go on to the next step, and that's what we're, we're hoping to do now. Uh, other measures of toxicity, you can see that the uh, IP bolus group, if you look at white blood cell count during the course of therapy, you actually do see a much larger hit uh, for my bolus than you do from the devices, which is uh, sort of expected based on the other measures of toxicity. So we've got some pretty important uh, conclusions from the first year of work. A device achieves a, can be made to achieve an actually higher AUC, uh, but actually lower uh, uh, toxicity measures which is exactly where we want to go. Uh, we're still optimizing the, the dose for this animal model. And there's really, in, in the end, there is no difference uh, in tumor burdens, no statistical difference in tumor burden between the two groups. So we, we think we're getting closer to the proper dose. So the next steps, well, uh, as I said, we want to find the actually maximum tolerated dose so to see if we can actually increase the dose by device to the point where it has the same sort of toxicity that you see from IP bolus groups and see what the, uh, uh, what the effect on tumor burden is in that case. Uh, we, want, we were already in the process of designing from based on this data what a human scale device would look like and uh, we're evaluating what the pharmacokinetics and safety uh, profile of such a device might be in a large animal model will be uh, actually our next step. Uh, so that'll probably be a porcine model and we've got some, maybe some other features in that study we hope to add in the next, uh, in the next uh, portion of the program. Uh, maybe even, interestingly enough, an efficacy endpoint uh, in a cancer model in, in a pit. And there's finally, there's evidence in a, um, of synergistic interactions between cisplatin, dose this way, and targeted therapies, specifically PARP inhibitors. About 40% of covariant cancer patients respond to such inhibitors. And uh, there's, there's reason to believe that local delivery of those agents actually might uh, be more effective also. So we're going to study that in animals also. And then I just end with, uh, with a picture of what these types of devices might look like that are in a, um, uh, in an, for a human. Uh, and this is done with, uh, we, we haven't mentioned, one of our collaborators is Marcelo Del Carmen, Dr. Marcelo Del Carmen, who's a surgeon that is helping us with the actual design of this device to be compatible with procedures in, in the OR. And, um, and so we're trying to decide between devices that actually look long and thin like this that, that she and surgeons can, can place throughout the peritoneal cavity, or actually multiple smaller devices, maybe three or four, that are actually shaped like this to avoid any potential uh, toxicity uh, associated with um, anatomical um, you know, knots being formed of such a long device around 
around that testing, for example. So that's, uh, we're taking this into consideration, and these are the types of uh, devices we'll probably explore in a 4C model. So I'll end there and take any questions.